The X670 motherboard just hit the shelves and is uh, already a brand new source of anxiety for me. So I decided to start this brand new season with um, a good starter. The entry level of entry level, so you can see what you can um, at least expect out of the motherboards AMD is sending our ways. Today, we are reviewing the Prime X670P from Asus, a great do-it-all motherboard which focuses mainly on bringing you the best of what this new chipset brings at a bottom dollar price. At least that's what it tries. Now, fun fact for you, did you know that the mouse-like marsupial called the Antikinus can have love sessions lasting up to 14 hours long? <laughs> 14 hours. <laughs> The Prime is really a one size fit it all kind of motherboard. It is Asus wide spectrum motherboard. And the P, it's entry entry level. It really goes after the lower end budget builders out there, but still wants to remain a viable alternative to, say, the tough or even its more expensive uh, pro sibling. And to do so, Asus has to be extremely careful on what is going to put on this motherboard so that to keep that very delicate balance of feature against very, very low price tag. A promise Asus um, makes with the Prime series, but does not always keep. Now, starting with the obvious. And today's the obvious is its chipset. This thing is powered by the brand new X670 chipset, which brings a lot of changes. First, it has two chips. We got our Northbridge and our Southbridge chips, which is AMD's way to address the heat issues it encountered with its previous generation X570 chipset, which did require an active cooling solution more often than not. Instead, the X670 splits its features between two separated 7 watt chips, both of which are cooled by the same heat shield. In the Prime X670P case, despite having a long, wide, and rather thick heat shield, it struggles to keep the chips below 50 degrees Celsius, which is quite a lot. The two big novelties the X670 chipset series brings in are PCIe 5.0 and DDR5 RAM support. Well, that's true only in part. On X670 powered motherboards, we do have available PCIe 5.0 lanes, but only because it is brought by the processor, not from the chipset. Other than that, the X670 chipset only brings marginal improvements when compared to its predecessor, namely more PCIe lanes and an improved USB USB support. Now that's covered. Let's take a closer look to the motherboard. Here we are dealing with a six layered PCB ATX motherboard, exactly what I usually expect in order to support the more demanding PCIe 4 and 5 signaling, whilst providing a better VRM heat diffusion and a better audio static isolation. Now, design wise, as seen in all P series, we have a very clean, bare bone motherboard. Nothing but essentials. I do like the more prominent passive cooling components, which does show a rather premium care to their finish. As the PCP goes, it shows an interesting solar system orbiting pattern to hide its deserted configuration, but the overall feel of the board is sturdy and gives a rather reassuring sense of higher graded manufacturing process. RGB wise, the board shows no embedded RGB strips, an obvious budget care, and instead we have five RGB connectors, three of which are addressable. Now, CPU socket wise, well, here we get a small revolution in AMD's world, which is um, ditching the PGA CPU socket model it has entertained for the past 20 years and finally jumping onto the LGA model, which Intel has been rocking since the early 2000s. Now, the AM5 CPU socket features 1,718 pins providing a low pressure contact to the CPU and deploying enough bandwidth to introduce the brand new PCIe 5.0 standard, which provides no less than four gigabyte per second worth of data per PCIe lane against only two on PCIe 4.0 lanes. Obviously, we know that this CPU socket <laughs> uh, um, supports Ryzen 7000 series, but if we look at AMD track record, this very CPU socket should be staying around and we should have compatibility forward for at least two or three next generation of Ryzen 7000 series. So I 
think we're gonna have it for at least three to four years before anything else changes. Now VRM wise, well, the Prime Z690P features 840 amps of power configured in a 12 plus two phases configuration, 720 of which are CPU centric. Now 720 amps these days and with the Ryzen 7000 series is really not that much. Running a 7900X was fine if I stayed around 5.3 gigahertz. If you try to get to any higher clock, you will encounter freezes, reboots, or blue screens. And that is quite a common instance when you have an underpowered VRM with more demanding CPUs. As cooling components go, they show a rather premium manufacturer, large radiating areas, and thick walls to store excess heat. In addition, they do have a double contact design, allowing a thermopadded contact with both chokes and power stages. In our case, in order for me to run a 60 minute stress test, I did have to stay to that very stable 5.3 gigahertz and temps results were, you know, acceptable. The main VRM block stayed below or around 50 degrees Celsius, having an even heat spread all over its extended radiating roof and the side block was logically a little hotter, oscillating between 50 and 53 degrees Celsius. I mean, I, I do not have much grief against this VRM. Uh, knowing that this is really like a, a, a lower budget motherboard for you know lower budget build but you need to know what you're getting and you should know what kind of processor you can couple this VRM with and I would not uh, um, advise anything beyond a 7600 and avoid overclocking anything on this because overclocking just won't work I, I mean you you can try to it's enabled and all that but you're going to go really in a world of pain if you do so. Memory wise, our Prime X670P supports up to 128GB of DDR5 RAM clockable up to 6.4GHz, which is really, really fast because this is usually the clocks I find on five to six hundred dollars motherboard. So definitely um, a clock which will attract a more production minded uh, uh, clients, I think. So Definitely a good point, one of the very few on this motherboard. Now, staying in the memory, we have three M.2 solid set drives, one of which is PCIe 5.0 compliant, allowing data swaps up to a novel 128 gigabit per second with compatible sticks, that is. And obviously, this is where Asus decided to place its unique thermal padded heat shield in order to keep it cool and avoid thermal throttling. The two other sticks are PCIe 4.0 compatible, which is still plenty fast since they can both swap data up to 64 gigabit per second each. Watch out though, they are not heat shielded, uh, so make sure to place your boot drive here to ensure best OS response. Now, a small note for the screwless mechanism on the CPU link M.2 connector. I am sad not to see it everywhere, but obviously happy to see it at least once represented, especially knowing that these kind of budget motherboards do not usually use more than one M.2 solid state drive at a time. SATA wise, we do have still and always our six Jurassic era SATA 3s, which will do a great job at supporting all of your legacy drives or make old tech timers feel relevant again. Export wise, we do have four export slots, three 16 slots with different speeds and a single slot, single speed. As usual, only the closest one to your CPU has 16 active PCIe lanes. Therefore, this is where you'd want your GPU for optimal performances, hence the metallic reinforcement. Worth noting, it does operate at PCIe 4.0 standard, meaning that it can swap up to 32 gigabyte per second worth of data. Now the two other 16 slots only operate four lanes each, but at a surprisingly fast PCIe 4.0 standard, meaning that they could potentially run maybe a second GPU because you know it's still eight gigabyte per second uh, worth of data swap. So I mean I, I can easily imagine uh, um, an RTX 3070 running full potential on either of those. So definitely. This motherboard was not made for that purpose, but something I'd like you to notice anyways. Now, I do realize that many of you may say, hey, Intel motherboards provides PCIe 5.0 standard on all their GPU slots, so why only PCIe 4 here? Why not, why not AMD? Well, I'm not sure this is a bad thing. We do not have any PCIe 5.0 uh, uh, GPUs, and we're not gonna have any for at least 
I say four years. So it's really not something you want to waste PCIe 5.0 lanes on. But we do have PCIe 5.0 enabled storage. So I'd rather see it on the storage on the M.2 connectors than where I know we're never going to use. So yeah, I kind of agree with the pragmatism of AMD or ASUS on this case. Now, back IO wise, well, a rather basic configuration. First, let me note the absence of an antiquated backplate. I do not know how much it would have cost to add those two extra screws and get it there, uh, but probably way much more than ASUS wanted to spend for our quality of life and comfort. And starting from the left, we have a PS2 keyboard mouse connector. Great for my great grandfather. Two second generation USB plugs, a flashback button. Great for CPU less BIOS upgrade. Definitely a plus for incoming CPU installation. An HDMI and display port for integrated graphics, which is now available on every Ryzen 7000 series. No more G series who had some graphics integrated in there. It only took a decade to AMD to figure that out. Well done, you're quick. Four USB 3.0 plugs, as well as three 10 gigabit USB plugs. But most importantly, we have a 20 gigabit per second type C USB plug, which I am rather happy to see here. Next, we have a standard 2.5 gigabit LAN. And finally, our rather modest, but not too bad ALC897 audio codec from Realtek filtered by 220 ohms only worth of capacitors. I mean, just don't expect too much out of it. It's, it's, um, they're okay with that being great and they're okay with that being bad. I mean, they're, they're just okay. Uh, overall, it's a rather basic, predictable Bakayo. It's in kind of par with the status of the, of the Prime P series. Um, I mean, Asus did not try to shine here, and they definitely did not. Now, front panel connector-wise, it's not much better. We have our usual two USB second generation connectors, good for monitoring purposes, a five gigabit type A front panel connector as well as a five gigabit type C. Cooling wise, we have our six fan connectors, including an all-in-one pump connector, which will be about the only thing strong enough to keep a Ryzen 7000 from self-combusting. I mean, what do you want me to say? It's just the bare minimum here. Uh, Asus did not want or even try to revolutionize the budget world. That's for sure. And troubleshooting wise, well, it's very simple. We got nothing, not even an easy debugger, which when you know that this motherboard has to juggle with three different PCIe standard every second of its existence is simply terrifying. And, and there's also the fact that, you know, when you run a Ryzen 7000 series, the booting delay is Crazy. The first time I installed a Ryzen 7900X on this motherboard, it took it three full minutes to post. And the problem is because you don't know where the booting process is at, you're there just wondering and you put it off and you put it on and you put it off and you make things worse. And 99% of the people in this known universe will do the very same thing. They'll wait 20 seconds like, what's going on? They'll press on the keyboard, nothing is happening. They'll just put it off, put it on, put it off, put it on. I mean, this is a $300 motherboard. There is plenty of room to add an easy debugger. So I find it completely unacceptable and, and uh, very disappointing coming from Asus here. Now, in conclusion, at 290 bucks without taxes, the Prime X 670p is simply not worth it. I see it loud and clear. I mean, there are good points, like, I mean, you'll find them, but for the rest, the underwhelming VRM, the overheating chipset, and the complete lack of troubleshooting features, it just makes me wonder where did Asus get its pricing from? I mean, if it was worth $190, I would definitely suggest it uh, for, you know, low budget builds, no problem. There, there are some good stuff in there. It, it will last some time. But 300 bucks? I just released last week uh, my review of the Z690 Aros Master, which is at about $300 today, but is an absolutely fantastic motherboard. It's a beast of power and a beast of features. 
So yeah, I feel like Asus is getting really too comfortable with us. It's not enough to just produce a PCB and you know stamp Asus on that to get some premium cash. That's not how it works. And it's really a big lack of imagination coming from usually a very good innovative team of people. In short, yeah, uh, unless the Prime X670P pricing goes below 200 bucks, I cannot under no circumstances advise you to buy it. It's sad, but it's true.